Alright, it should be another draft physics video presentation. I'll just make sure it looks like it. Um, so we'll do some comments and then maybe a Sabim Hassan Pfeffer video thingy. Um, general subjects of the unification and what's wrong with the existing theories and uh, some of that crap, generally speaking. Um, yeah. And uh, I have to say, you know, I'm just feeling so confident, you know, that I have the right answer. It's just, you know, I'm sitting here in this kind of ludicrous position of um, just finding physics so trivially broken. I mean, the broken is all over it. It's just saying right on it to, you know, out of order, <laughs> you know, this doesn't work. Don't put a quarter in this machine. I mean, it's just all over it. This is a lemon they're selling you. It's not the right answer. It's not even close to the right answer. It's so far from the right answer. Um, you know, and so I, I, don't, <laughs> I, I kind of don't know how to be kind of obnoxious as if I'm talking to aliens because to me it's just so obvious now. But anyway. <clears throat> so, in a related comment, uh, what are your views of Eric Weinstein's geometric unity theory? I think it's got a lousy title. Um, <clears throat> nonsense? I don't know. What can I tell you? He's supposed to be fixing it, and it looks a lot more broken. I mean, it's just another woo theory, so what do you want me to say? Yeah, sorry, not even close. Um... You know, this whole, the universe is a neural network kind of horseshit, you know. Uh, a bunch of, um, there's no simple mechanics to it, really. He talks as if it's simple. Oh, you just take a device and you just change a couple of little variables and you get a different outcome and you can get this. But it's all fractally. And this really isn't about fractals. So anyway, he seems sufficiently critical of the standard physics. Yeah, well, that's, you know, uh, that is easy to do, in my opinion. Um, physics bullshit. Um, but yes, it, it, like most dissidents, right? Now, how not we see this with most all the dissidents? Their, their fix is some religious thing or some um, magic thing or some fractal thing or some other thing. You know, there's nothing, let's make, let's come up with an idea that's simpler. There doesn't seem to be anybody but me who's doing that. Okay. Uh, the universities have been about for 50 years. Well, it's been longer than that, unfortunately, but yes, it is just so bad. All right, so I've read your comment. I'm going to remove it just because it's not really the subject, what the other nutcases are doing, uh, <laughs> frankly. The other humans, um, there's just, there, there's two, there's nothing, there's no common objective, it doesn't seem, or any common sense of what the logic would look like. So, there's just so little for me to find as any kind of, I mean, even their critiques of this standard model are, to me, missing all the target areas, um, the places where they should be stunned that they got away with that. I mean, even the 2x Einstein bending of light, you know, what, <laughs> that, that doesn't make any sense. Wait, what, the, what is that crap? Okay, and then, you know, and then things like LIGO. I don't see them complaining about, well, all of a sudden we came up with this theory that matter can be turned into bent space. What the hell are you talking about? You know, not forces, not energy, some kind of bent space stuff. What, what what is that? Where 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 did that theory get tested? Where where, where what are you talking about? You know, and the whole bouncing the thing back and forth inside of mirrors and saying I can it's a it's a solid ruler even though we can't be sure how far into the mirror the light went. I mean, the whole thing doesn't make any sense anyway. Why are we on a degrading orbit, saddy face, from Mister Snuffly or something? Snaffle, e, whatever. Who cares? frankly. First off, why is this important? Um, and the physics is so nuanced that no one could really say if you're talking about, you know, billions of years of a time frame, uh, the universe might degrade everything's velocity over 
billions of years not everything in terms of photons but everything in terms of material things um, they might not be able to maintain they might lose a little bit of their internal energy that's keeping them moving over time and we wouldn't be able to really measure tiny little differences and all that kind of thing um, but you know the standard notion is that the earth is pretty stable and currently and that the real problem is that the sun isn't very stable. The sun's going to lose its, you know, mojo, uh, going to burn up all of its small atoms, and it's going to be heavy with a bunch of big atoms. And, um, you know, it's going to convert itself into um, heavier atoms and, uh, you know, helium to hydrogen. And uh, that it is going to do some funky crap um, as it reforms itself, let's say, uh, it's supernovas. But whatever, who cares? It's not the subject. It's not even close to a subject. I'm doing real physics, that is, the physics that runs the universe and causes the effects. I don't really care about these subtle things, about what the exact effect is. This is not really relevant, all the effects. There's a zillion effects. Me talking as well, you know, try to analyze every effect and uh, figure out how long the effect can is durable and all that. No, I'm, uh, you know, come on, got better things to do with my time, fella. So, another junk comment. All right, Dino, who I, I didn't respond to his other defense of trolls, um, but um, yeah, he's full of shit. So, I'll just say, same shitty arguments, same stupid arguments. We should just accept slander as part of living in America. Well, fuck that. All right. Um, <clears throat> you know, somebody should be able to call you a Holocaust denier and paint a Hitler mustache on you, even though you've never said anything positive about Nazis, except they had pretty uniforms. But otherwise, the whole philosophy was pointed out to be insanely bigoted. Um, and, you know, just because you don't agree with a few lampshade-type assertions regarding what happened in the Holocaust, all of a sudden you're a Holocaust denier and you're anti-Semitic. Now, maybe you think that's okay. I don't think it's okay. I think that's fucking bullshit. And uh, so, fuck you. Sorry, but one more question about the double slit experiment. I've seen several videos and animations of the detection screen building a pattern out of individual interactions. Yes, now we already went over this pretty extensively, but there's this, a video by Veritasium where he's using single photons, okay, to create the double slit. Now, first problem is he's using a device that doesn't have a wide enough field of view to even see the double slit experiment, so that's a big problem. Um, and he clearly, the flaw in the experiment is this idea that you have to first test with nothing in the way. You have to first do a control experiment to see if you are actually sending single photons. That is, you can't allow anything to screw with the photon. You just have to see how many photons are hitting a surface. Then you put the experiment in the way and see what happens. So until they do it right, it doesn't matter. They can make a claim that only one photon a second is going through, but it's just a claim. They never demonstrate that that's the actual truth. And that's a huge flaw in the reasoning. Um, so <clears throat> I'd say as when they do this with electrons, it's real bogus, as I've pointed out, because they're using the electron's fake de Broglie frequency to define the size of the electron, right? So they're basically saying the electron has a polarization, you know, that's quite gigantic, whatever that's polarization would be. So it's a notion that doesn't work at all. Um, and so the electron is a tiny little object. We know it's just a millionth of the, you know, composition of an atom itself. So you clearly can't build a two-slit experiment that's confining to an electron. It's a silly notion. But anyway, <clears throat> um, interactions when they're not being observed. Okay, so now the, this is the observation thing. Now, I've already pointed out they've never, ever even tried to observe a photon. So that's the first, you can't observe photons without annihilating them. You, they have to hit something and be transformed into a new photon or whatever happens to them. They have to go through the transition process. So you can't measure a photon without radically changing its momentum, its direction, everything about it. 
And so there is no observing a photon, clearly. And the same problem with electrons. Electrons are so tiny, there's nothing you could bounce off of them that'll give you any information. It's like hitting a Volkswagen. It's like hitting a Rolls Royce with a Volkswagen, let's say, I don't know, or vice versa. And then saying, based on how the Volkswagen bounces off of the Rolls Royce, I'll be able to tell you what the Rolls Royce was doing. It's just very impractical. Not really going to happen. So, um... <clears throat> It's, it's a silly. That they, they they it should be something physics goes nowhere near talking about detecting because it's all just a thought experiment. It has nothing to do with actual physical reality. All right. Anyway, um, the individual interactions when they're not being observed to prove the wave particle duality principle. Well, obviously they can't prove it with that because they can't do it. So it can't be a thought experiment. Is a very poor proof, frankly. Uh, but I've never seen a video of the pattern building up <laughs> in the two bands they say will occur when the detector is placed <laughs> on one of the two slits. Well, because it doesn't. We already know from Newton that photons don't travel okay, um, through slits without being disturbed by the surfaces, I'm arguing clearly. Um, they hit electrons and they get scattered. So. Clearly, that's the cause of the effect, in my opinion. It just doesn't need any more conversation than that. Um, <clears throat> so we already know from Newton that these particles aren't like throwing baseballs through a hole in a wall. <laughs> and even the baseballs, again, will hit the edge you know, and go funny directions. So it's still a lie to point out that there's no uh, consistency to it. Depending on what I throw through what hole, I will get patterns. Okay, so it is a fact that I can create patterns. So they're denying reality just by making this silly argument that things just go straight through the hole and that's the only choice they ever have. Um, <clears throat> so it's a bad example. Um, it shouldn't be part of their physics. Again, it shouldn't be part of their argument. It's just crap. Um, what else to say about that? Um, okay, so anyway, principle. But I've never seen a video of the pattern building up to the two bands they say will occur when a detector is placed on one of the slits. Right, well none of the detector experiments ever happened. They're thought, they're, they're just making it up. They're obviously, look, I've explained this before, but I just one more time, you know, just to emphasize the point, you could just understand from your own, you know, intuitive knowledge, that let's say I had a slit and I put a detector here and I was going to detect what was going through the slit with this detector, right? You can see that. Okay. Um, you know that this detector is going to have force. It's 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 throwing things, and so it's you're, you're saying I'm going to see the big thing by throwing something little at it. That's the idea. But you you know we don't have anything small enough, right? And as I've pointed out, a photon can't even hit an electron, right? The whole photon is this, you know, it's a, a whole sequence of stuff, and it's the whole sequence of stuff that's not in the same place in space. You know, it's not moving the same path exactly and so only one quanta of a photon can hit an electron so so you've got no chance of you know doing a single electron you have no way of seeing a single electron it's impossible well, anyway and you know the momentum when you hit this electron you're going to move the electron this way and that's the only choice okay photons don't make electrons move towards them photons make them move away so the you know if they're going to get a pattern you're going to get a pattern way over here right there's no chance you're not going to deflect the electron substantially. So you wouldn't get a pattern here. You wouldn't get a blob here. You get a blob way over here. So it makes no intuitive sense. It's just, it's, and again, they can't do it. It's impossible to do. Electrons are hard to detect even when they hit something. You know, you have to see, this is part of the stuff where you have to read some of these crappy papers before you understand how... This is a lot more complicated than they make it sound. They make it sound like, oh, I just turned my electron gun on and I just shoot electrons and that's it and then we're done. No, 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 no. <clears throat> electron detector is usually some kind of phosphorescent thing. So the electron goes in and actually creates a visual photon out. And that's how we detect electrons. But the catch is that if you shoot this thing with an x-ray, okay, it also creates a photon out. So you can't really tell whether you're an X-ray or an electron hits something. Now, the the way to use it, say they put this fl fluorescing screen on the side and they move the electron this way. Well, then if you push it with a magnetic field, right, and I push the electron into the screen, well, then you know you're seeing electrons because 
you can push electrons into the screen and the photons will go this way. So the x-rays will go this way and the, pho you know, the photon part of the electron beam. See, the electron beams always have photons in them. So, so you can't... The photons are what's pushing the electrons. This is the irony of the whole stupid thing is that every time they have a beam of electrons, it's full of photons, okay? There's a ton of photons pushing those electrons. So if I look at it this way, the screen's going to fluoresce it from both the photons that are hitting it and the electrons that are hitting it. Where if I push them into a screen, I can only push the electrons. I can't push the photons. There's All of it's covered in these little details that physics just whitewashes away. And when you really analyze the details, like I said, that's where the devil is way all over the place. Like the LIGO thing. The idea that you can bounce your photon into 1,600 mirrors, you know, mirror surfaces. 1,600 interactions with a mirror. And then tell me exactly how far the photon traveled. When there's no way to know how deep each photon went into the mirror each time it hit the mirror. It could have gone... 10 atoms could have gone two atoms <laughs> how can that be an accurate can't be can't be all right anyway <clears throat> never seen a video of the pattern building up okay a curve so the detector placed all right so the two bands they say occur when the detector is placed in the slits right it's all a story it has nothing to do with reality it didn't happen you can't number one it's theoretically impossible as i'm pointing out they never did it. There's no paper detecting. Doesn't happen. Never happened. So is there any way to actually demonstrate the phenomenon in real world? Or is it simply a mathematical prediction? It's not a mathematical prediction either, frankly. It's just their interpretation. It's like a Copenhagen or a many worlds. It's an interpretation of how the thing functions. They've given it these properties and assigned the properties, and all they've said is, well, these properties make it consistent with our current mathematics. They don't have any new mathematics that does this prediction, and their mathematics, again, doesn't predict it. Okay, They're just putting it in as a variable, and now they get a better answer out, but that's it. I'm not talking about placing polarizing filters over the slit, so this is a whole other issue where... I mean, I should, you know, I'll point this out just to, just so for the record. I mean, all this stuff is such crap. So every time they mention this bell in inequality and, and use this as some kind of excuse for entanglement and why it has to be entanglement and can't be hidden variables, it's just more crap about a misunderstanding regarding the function of polarization and the rules of polarization. So the trick is, is I can put a polarized filter in this way and then I can put one in at different degrees. So we start with this. All right, and if I put it at 22 degrees, the next filter, or I put it at 45 degrees, all right, so this is 45, this is 22, okay, and if I put it, so at, at 22 degrees, I only block 15%, okay, at 45, I block 50, all right, and so what they're doing, the logical made stake they're making is they're saying, well, so you only get 15 by this much, and so twice that much should only give you 30%, right? So only 30% should be blocked at 45 degrees, because they're saying 20, you know, 15 plus 15 should be 30, not 50, right? Because they're not conceding that, no, it's, it's, a, it's a progressive curve, okay? It, it blocks even less at one degree, and even, you know, so one degree is really small, like, you know, <clears throat> you know, 0.5 you get blocked, you know, and then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger as you increase the degrees. So if you have this idea that, yes, so, so if I drew that as a chart, it would be like this way blocks just a little bit. The next one, the longer line, longer line, longer line, more and more getting blocked. So if you'd had this as the number getting blocked, you could see that <clears throat> very few are blocked you know, with the first degree, and a lot are, so a lot are blocked with this last degree, very few are blocked with the first degree, if you get the idea. It gets progressively more blocked. That's how you get to 50%. So they go in and they say, well, there's a 75% number that I should be getting um, when I do this Allen Aspect experiment. This is what I am expecting. I get 85%. 
Okay, so I, oh, it, the, the Bell inequality says this can't happen. Okay, 85% is impossible because it's outside the realm of, you know, flipping coins. You, it's impossible to flip coins and get, um, you know, a, a million times and get 75% heads and 25% tails. You can't do it. It's, it's beyond what the probability makes within the realm of the universe creating as an aberration. It's not an aberration. It's possible within the realm of reasonable, um, plausibly <clears throat> to be an event we actually witness. And we certainly couldn't repeat the event, right? So it's like me rolling the Yahtzee dice, having all the dice stack on top of each other, and then I repeat the experiment 15 times, and each time it does the same thing. That is implausible as being something the universe could ever produce. That's the Bell inequality. So they say, this is impossible. It can't be caused, you know. And the whole thing is dependent, though, on this assumption being correct that this is actually how it works, that it should be 30%, that somehow it is 15% here, and that means that 215 should act equal 30. But so it's built on a stupid, idiotic premise that the axiom is in totally incorrect and totally unproven. So that's why they got the wrong answers, because they don't know that, no, this is progressive. The more... The more off the filter is, the more light it blocks. So it gets to 50%, not 30%, because it's progressively getting harder and harder for the photon to get through the filter. Simple answer. The whole thing goes away. You don't need entanglement now. You don't need the wooey answer, because uh, if you used rational premises to begin with, you wouldn't you would find the hidden variable you'd find the reason that's it's not coming out with the result you expect the reason is you made a wrong assumption about how polarizing filters work all right so where was i so is there any way to actually blah 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 no i'm not talking about placing polarizing filters over the slits and shining a laser through it which instantly destroys the pattern I don't know if it really does that, but whatever. I'm talking about the claim that firing individual photons at the double slit and seeing the two band pattern build over time. Can this actually happen in our real universe or just the math models? Well, again, you're talking about putting detectors on. Detectors are an idiotic notion. The only thing they could possibly detect are the buckyballs they say they do. But even in that experiment, they have big trouble because guess what? The pattern they get with buckyballs is almost imperceptibly dull and blurred. It's such a bad pattern that you could probably destroy it by just blowing on the experiment. All right. So another similar question, I suppose. Oh, no, what do I want to do? Whoops. I don't want to do that, whatever the hell that was. All right, read more. I won't bother deleting it, but, uh, you know, I did answer it, so I probably should delete anything I answer. I think I understand the physics of how lasers can be turned down to show individual interactions with the detector screen. Well, they really can't. But whatever, let's, well, let's presume that you can make a device that produces photons very irregularly. Yes. Um, but how in the hell do they claim that they do that with electrons? Well, uh, your guess is as good as mine, because yes, that seems it's a little tougher. But clearly you could detect how many electrons get to the fluorescing screen and create a photon, so you could sort of make a very low flow of electrons, I suppose, by putting obstacles in the way of the electrons <clears throat> and destroying as many as you can and just letting a few get through a little tiny screen. <clears throat> I've asked Google this question and users <clears throat> in the other forums, but all over I get back is the same flood of lame um, regurgitations of how the double slit experiment works and why it's magic. Well, yes, the fact that it doesn't seem, I'm not getting anything right rational as a counter argument here, clearly, um, except some notion that somehow I must be wrong and they must be right, and they're just ignoring the fact that double, look, I said, I've played everybody, every single physics thing you play. They don't even show the right pattern, right? So, I mean, just how lame is this? Okay. 
anyone here knows the details of how that part of the experiment claims to work or where I can get more info about it from anywhere besides the intellectual garbage pit known as Quora. Yeah, well, all the forums are garbage. Frankly, trying to do physics in text, uh, you know, without drawings, without, I mean, it doesn't seem very practical to me. It's really, it's tough to ask a question that, that is, you know, to describe, well, yeah, the chalk has some facets on one end from use where it's been flattened and then it's round, but it's spherical, but it has an arc and it's, you know, and it's very hard to describe stuff, you know, in text sometimes. Anyway, apologies for anyone who have a good experience of Quora. I have only ever frustratingly bad ones that completely wasted my time. Well, the problem is it's just a lot of, you know, fake know-it-alls. And, and there's a few, like, people that have some sort of knowledge. And it's hard to get their attention. So you end up having an argument with the idiots instead of an argument with the person that can actually understand what you're talking about and say, oh yeah, I understand that whole polarization thing being the core of all the entanglement experiments. Yeah, they're using polarization. They're calling it spin, but they're really, it's polarization they're measuring. They're not, they're not doing spin experiments. Um, that's Stern-Gerlach, and um, you know those experiments, again, another premised on a whole bunch of lies, like somehow well, as I watch a silver atom move through space, I'm somehow measuring the electron's magnetic moment, <laughs> which doesn't seem very rational. Okay, um, you know, uh, just on its face, right? To say you're measuring something that you can't see. Uh, but anyway, all right, so that's enough of the comments. So we will move along to this video. And, you know, I, 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 you know, Sabine's an interesting character. I liked her music videos. Um, uh, she speaks well and, uh, you know, uses words well and lots to admire about her as a person, as a woman and all that crap. But she just talks shit. I mean, she's a hypocrite. I mean, it's, she's just saying, look, the Jesus theory is a really great theory, and the Jesus theory is really strong and really powerful, and really blah, blah, blah. But that Mohammed theory is silly, and it's nonsensical, and well, what do you need a god for, and blah, blah, blah. You know. So when she's talking about their religion, it's all horse shit. When she's talking about her own religion, oh, it's the most sacred, beautiful thing the universe ever came up with. We're all brilliant and fantastic. Einstein did great work, blah, 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 blah. So it's all just, to me, it's duplicity. It's not just hypocrisy. It's duplicity. She's doing it right in front of us, pretending that she's tearing down the bad guys when, no, your, your Jeebus story is just as silly as their Mohammed story. I mean, get real. No. It's, it's, it's just as bad. I get constantly asked. Oh, I'm constantly asked? Okay, I should have got this sped up a little too much, maybe. We'll go to 125. She's constantly asked. If I could please comment on other people's theories of everything. Yeah, so this used to be called the unification theory, right? Just a simple term, unification. Now they're calling it grand unification theory, or theory of everything. And it's just the same thing Einstein was working on, in the sense that Einstein basically said, yeah, the universe is some sort of evolving clock thing. It's just, you know, it's a mechanical device. And um, there's, you know, that's what we should be looking for. And mechanical devices wouldn't, you know, Einstein did the obvious and said there wouldn't be, the universe wouldn't poof two different elemental mechanisms. And maybe even it occurred to Einstein that, you know, the speed of light is the same as the speed of gravity. How can there be different things and have exactly the same speed? It's like, you know, it's like picking out of all the varieties of living things on Earth. You just pick two by random. And they just happen to run the same speed. I mean, what's the odds? Pretty thin, I'd say. That could be Garrett Lisi's E8 theory, or Eric Weinstein's geometric unity, or Stephen Wolfram's idea that the universe is but a big graph, and so on. And so on. Yeah, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. Um, <clears throat> I mean, this all goes back to, again, you know, none, none of these people want to talk about it, but they have to go way back. And so I would argue you have to go back to this idea of push and pull. That's where you start. And 
you know, and go go to their, you know, I haven't gotten to the Fermilab guy, but, you know, let's understand, you know, this is what they believe, okay? They, part of their theory, part of their nonsense is some idea of a force-carrying particle, you know, and, and, you know, they call it a virtual photon, but it's this silly idea that, you know, there's two things, and this thing somehow sends a messenger here, you know, a, a, a particle, and that particle says to it, move towards me or move away from me, right? So the particle somehow can tell it to pull. What do you mean? This has momentum going this way. It's not going to do any of this way thing. This way is not going to be one of the choices. So it's like you hitting the bowling pin and the pin flies back and hits you in the face. <laughs> I mean, come on. This is a silly notion that this little messenger particle goes back and forth and tells things. Oh, no, you're supposed to move this way. Oh, no, you're supposed to move that way. Oh, no, you go this way. No, you go that way. I mean, it it works to explain charge because they have to explain why the electron and the proton, all right, are hit by the same thing and they do two different things. The electron goes this way and the proton goes this way. They have to explain that. And so they came up with this, and it's just, it's silly, frankly. It's not a very good answer. Good then. Let me tell you what I think about this. But I'm afraid it may not be what you wanted to hear. Before we start, let me remind you what physicists mean by a theory of everything. So, again, what physicists mean, with it, you know, <laughs> this doesn't have to be complicated. You're talking about unifying. You're saying, look, this is a, this is a, the universe is, like Feynman described, you know, checkerboard. There's something simple happening. It's just happening in such a dense and amazingly huge uh, uh, surface that, yes, the checkers can be in all kinds of bizarre patterns in all kinds of places. Be, you know, even though it's just simple, it's just red and black things, but you can make all kinds of, you know, merry on toast and, you know, all kinds of things can be made out of that uh, simple mechanism. And that that's the idea, that's the Einstein idea, is that there's a simple thing happening, simple rules, at the origin of the universe. And that all it's had is a lot of time. And with a lot of time, very simple rule, very simple etch-a-sketch kind of rules of telling something where it's going to move can end up creating very, very complex universe. For all we currently know, the universe and everything in it is held together by four fundamental interactions. That's the electromagnetic force, the strong and the weak nuclear force, and gravity. Right. Well, let's just say these are all just descriptions of the same thing, okay? Uh, that would be the unification. Um, and that your problem is, is that you're not understanding that they're made out of something and that the, the something would be the word quantum. That would be what your whole theory is based on, is this idea of Planckness and this idea that there's an elemental energy unit. Um, so again, they, they deny part of their own physics. Part of their own physics gets the right answer in terms of saying the idea that you, this, and, and the idea that it's conservational, that you can't destroy this bit of energy. You know, and then they end up creating this whole idea of vacuum space, poofing matter and poofing stuff, and it's just so bad. But they make it conservational because they say, well, nothing really annihilates and nothing really poofs. And, you know, so they use all this qualified language and all the rest of this stuff. But let's understand, all you need to do to explain all of it, okay, is to understand that um, there is just a, they're all functioning on this idea of a quantum of force and like I said the photon can be understood as quantums at force moving in a direction and then if you just take them and put them a little bit out of alignment all right you can create polarization so you can totally explain what a photon is and then you could understand that if it wasn't in the photon form that is it wasn't long enough ray or they were too far out of order or some other thing that this would be heat you know that this would be energy um, and then again, I've given the ping pong ball analogy that you can understand why electrons hate each other if you can just understand that, well, there's a force actually bouncing between them, reflecting, and it just keeps reflecting back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Well, the closer I bring the electrons, right, <clears throat> the more energy I actually create. So proximity creates energy. 
proximity equals energy. <clears throat> Uh, as funny as that sounds, you're creating energy because you're creating more interactions. Interactions are energy. Uh, the only way energy gets expressed is through interactions. So the more interactions you create, the more energy you create, in a sense. Um, but you know that the actual Planck, the actual bit of energy, the quanta, hasn't increased. You've just increased the number of interactions. So that's the complexity of it, right? So you're conserving, but you're making more energy. You conserve the amount of energy in the universe. It's just a bit moving, but because you're moving in a confined space, it's having more interactions than the rest of the bits that have to go much longer distances. And then the other simple thing to do is just to say, well, look, if I give these things two colors, um, you know, and I just have two interactions, the proton would be here and the, the electron. And if I hit, <coughs> if I hit the blue thing into the blue thing, I get a reflection. Um, you know, back and forth, and if I hit the blue thing into the yellow thing, I end up with a perpendicular, you know, the energy goes this way instead of reflecting. And something simple like that can explain how magnets work. Magnets are just filters. Uh, there are two forces. There's two kinds of matter, the, the positive and the negative, and that's all there are, electrons and protons. Neutrons are just composites of the two. I've explained how the atom works now. It's a magnetic atom. Okay, the atom has uh, a nucleus, okay, that's net positive, all right? The new neutrons are nothing. The extra protons are the real game. And, they're, and, you know, the strong force is just this, right? The strong force is this. So imagine these are two protons instead of electrons. Put P on there. And I put an electron in between them. Well, what's going to happen to all the energy? All the energy is going to leak out the electron. So there's no strong force holding protons together in the nucleus. There's no big strong force pushing them together. And all the force is leaked out. It's an incredibly weak force. <laughs> so that's the thing holding that thing together. And it's all magnetic. And the whole atom is is that you have your nucleus and then you have the bits floating around on the outside that are ne negative. These things hate each other. So therefore, if I try to push this one in, it'll put more pressure on this one and he'll fight back and this one will fight back. So it can't go further in, it can't go further out, it has to stay here. So once you get the geometry right, there's a hundred elements that'll stay in together. So a hundred arrangements of hexagons and such will make all of your atoms. And that's it. It's not, uh, can be explained very simply, very simple mechanism. That's what Einstein was looking for and that's what this conversation is about. And it's not about unifying these as separate forces. It's about unifying them as one function, one manifestation of something very simple. All other forces that you are familiar with, say the van der Waals force or muscle force, or the force that's pulling you down an infinite sequence of links on Wikipedia, these are all non-fundamental forces that derive from the four fundamental interactions, at least in principle. Now. Yeah, right. She shouldn't have brought up uh, conceptual forces. You know, she just stick to the mechanical ones. That yes, every time you push on something, you know, or pull on something, right? That the, the pull is actually a inverted push, and you know, those kind of arguments can be made. That every force is really just the magnetism and the electricity, which are the same force. They're just electrons moving. The electrons, when they move, they change the shape of the atoms. The atoms change their shape. It means they spew a different color to the universe. You know, all of that is what's making all of this happen. There's only one universe. That's probably part of her video that would have been important. To say there's one universe. It's the small one. Okay, <laughs> the small universe, er, the big universe emerges out of its function. There's no laws of the big universe. There's only laws of the little tiny elemental universe. When the Earth moves, it's because the electrons and the protons move. And they're moved by a force. And that force operates on their level, not this level. Um, you could, I, I could argue there's no such thing as gravity for an electron. There's no such thing as gravity for a proton because the gravity is in the form of charge for them. All they're seeing is yellow and blue. And when it's mixed, you could say red and blue. And when it's mixed, it's purple. So purple means don't do a damn thing. If it's blue, it means forward. If it's red, it means backward. 
three of the fundamental interactions, the electromagnetic and the strong and the weak nuclear force, are of the same type. They are collected in what is known as the standard model of particle physics. They really aren't. The standard model has all these bizarre things in it, all quirks and all kinds of other crap. It has all kinds of spin properties and all kinds of wacky crap that doesn't have anything to do with uh, Maxwell anyway. And certainly doesn't have anything to do with anything uh, obvious that a magnet's doing. The three forces in the standard model are described by quantum field theories, which means, in a nutshell, that all particles obey the principles of quantum mechanics. Like it doesn't, that's not what it means. It means there's a field, a separate field for every single one of their 400 different particles. Um, you know, and what, what sense does that make? It doesn't make any sense. Like the uncertainty principle, and they can be entangled, and so on. So all of that crap. So she buys into all that Jeebus story. You know, that's somehow the good story, that stupid entanglement thing, when there's just so little evidence of it and it makes no sense at all. Superluminal communication, the whole thing is ESP. It's, it's just, it's just, woo. Gravity, however, is described by Einstein's theory of general relativity and does not know anything about quantum mechanics. So it stands apart from the three other forces. So I, I've, I've said this before, but I, you know, I'm thinking like something like the photomultiplier, which really depends on kind of a logical argument. All right, and that you know maybe this this can be used to prove this ultimately. So I pointed out that this device <coughs> can basically be made more sensitive. So you have this photomultiplier, which can detect a tiny bit amount of radiation. So if you turn the photomultiplier to its higher sensitivity and, and then put it inside a black box, it'll still keep seeing photons. It'll keep clicking as if photons are still getting to it. All right, even though you put this like 10 feet of lead, you know, it's still collecting photons somehow. And if you turn its sensitivity up, um, I would argue that what you're seeing is small pieces of this energy. So when the energy is in a form where it's got, you know, let's just say this was nine pieces, then a human eye sees it. If it's four pieces, let's say a frog can see it. Well, the photomultiplier can do three, and it can do two, and maybe it can do one. And the idea is, is kind of this peak argument, that you push an electron right up to a peak. So you make it so any change will tip it, you know, one way or the other, so to speak. It'll roll down the hill. So you're, you're kind of putting an electron in a very, very uncomfortable position where it's almost going to fall out of the atom. You've pushed it to its bare limit. And that's how the device sort of works. Is the device sets up a bunch of these electrons. So if this one falls, this one falls, these two fall, this two fall, then these two fall, and these two fall. You know, So it sets up a chain reaction that's all dependent on tipping this one. And so in theory, you could understand that that, yeah, maybe that can detect this. And this, you know, the small aton, okay, the very small piece of a photon, right, just a one quarter of a photon that we could see, maybe that's gravity. That's what gravity is. It's just a bunch of pieces of a photon, okay, little hunks of photon. And, um, yeah, maybe we can detect that, actually without having to do this experiment. We can detect it in some other way besides doing that, which wasn't a great idea because I step on the chalk and make a mess. Ugh. Continuing. That's a problem because we know that all the quantum particles in the standard model have a gravitational pull, but we do not know how this works. We right, so they're all assuming it. They don't know it, they're assuming it. So. Again, it would be gravity in the sense that the force is the force. We're just saying that whether it's blue or red, right? No matter what, this little thing has a capacity to impose force. And if I mix both equal amounts of blue and red in an electron, that would be purple, right? But purple still has a net effect in the sense that it's still energy. And if I have more purple on one side and less purple on the other side, that the thing's going to end up having to move in the direction where there's less purple just do not have a theory to describe how elementary particles gravitate.
For this, we would need a theory for the quantum behavior of gravity, a theory of quantum gravity as... Right. We would need a theory that understands that the whole universe is just two things, right? It's this little tiny stuff moving the speed of light, the forces, and then the matter, which is these bigger things called electrons and protons that have no will of their own that are completely manipulated by the force. You change the force hitting them, they move wherever the change in the force is. So there's the force and then there's the matter that's moved by it. And that's it. Force doesn't move force, matter doesn't move matter. Force has to move matter. That simple starting point gives you, uh, just whoa, oh, opens, okay, uh, all kinds of avenues of rational thought rather than irrational thought. That's called. We need a theory of quantum gravity because general relativity and the standard model are mathematically incompatible. So far, this is a purely theoretical problem because with the... Yes, they're never going to be able to make charge into gravity because gravity is obviously missing that pull thing. I mean the push thing. So gravity is missing a fundamental element to electrons and protons, right? The two electron phenomenon. You can't make it with gravity. You can't make gravity do the away thing. So uh, it's fundamentally incompatible in that sense. And the only way you can understand how it is compatible is to understand that the atoms are net neutral. The atoms have as much red stuff as blue stuff and therefore unless they're in some sort of special configuration like a magnet they're just going to make purple all over the place they're going to push as much as they're pulling but you can have as much like I just said you can have more purple on one side than the other side and even though the two are pushing and pulling equally in the sense that the forces themselves are doing the same thing if you have more of it on one side than the other you're still going to have an effect experiments that we can currently do, we do not need to use quantum gravity. In all presently possible experiments, we either measure quantum effects, but then the particle masses are so small that we cannot measure the gravitational pull, or we can observe the gravity. Right, so you can. It's a tiny effect at these tiny mass levels. We already know that gravity, the purple force, the mixture of the force, is much weaker than when you segregate the force and shoot all blue at an electron or all, all uh, red at an electron. So obviously, if, if red means pull and red and blue means push to an electron, you can obviously kind of understand purple would be an incredibly weak force because it's not doing either one. Yeah. ...a pull of some objects, but then they do not have quantum behavior. So at the moment, we do not need quantum gravity to actually... Uh, yeah, no. So yeah, that's not, why, that's not why Einstein was looking for it, because you need it. He was looking for it because it's part of a, a way of looking at how the universe functions. And you either believe the universe is some wooey place, okay, or you believe it's an evolving thing. That the, the fact is the universe is a simple mechanism and its complexity is just made out of time. Time means that with a simple interaction, just turning left and right and having a simple rule, that you make a little Pac-Man go into all kinds of patterns and make all kinds of thicknesses of, of you can make all the Pac-Mans move in all kinds of places and create all kinds of arrangements with just really simple rules and that's a fact and um, it shouldn't be something disputed okay that you know the universe didn't poof Can you describe any observation the complexity didn't poof Whatever the elemental functions are, poof, okay, the first cause, but the first cause is a simple cause, not a complex cause. The first cause is an entanglement. However, this will hopefully change in the coming decades. I talked about this in an earlier video. Besides the missing theory of quantum gravity, there are various other issues that physicists have with the standard model. Most notably, it's that while the three forces in the standard model are all of the same type, they are also all different in that each of them belongs to a different type of symmetry. Physicists would much rather have all these forces unified to one, which means that they would all come from the same mathematical structure. Yeah, so again, it's all this math, 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 math. The math isn't all that reliable, doesn't mean all that much. It's just all kinds of wooey hyperbole. They all way exaggerate how well this whole thing ties together. And again, the simple argument is, is that there's a quanta of momentum in the universe. And when you put a bunch of it together, when you put it together in certain arrangements, 
you can detect it because it does the right thing to electrons. It does something to the matter bits that we can see. We can only see a force act when the force acts on a matter bit. We can't see the force act in space ever. It has to affect a piece of matter for us to know what happened. That simple notion eliminates all this conversation about ever interacting with a force in some passive way. In many cases, that structure is one big symmetry group. Since we do not observe this, the idea is that the big symmetry would manifest itself only at energies so high that we have not yet been able to test them. So this is another part of their axiology where they sit there and say that this is, you know, how fast they move a piece of matter and energy is somehow telling them how the thing works when obviously it's telling you what, how, you, how to destroy matter. You want to destroy the matter that is a complex piece of matter? Move it really fast. Because to move it really fast, you have to make all of its little bits move in a direction really fast. That is, if I take an atom and I say to the electrons and the protons, you have to go this way, the speed of force almost. Well, they can't be doing anything else then. They can't be doing this, and they can't be vibrating here and there, and they can't be doing anything else that would lengthen their path. They can only do one thing, that is, it's move from point A to point B to point C to point D, uh, almost at the speed of light. So they really can't do anything else. So all the functions that would be an atom are gone because you've annihilated them by making the atom into something that ha has no coherency. That pattern is broken. You have to break all of the existing pattern to turn it back into elemental um, entities that are moving in straight lines. So you're taking all the crooked lines out. You're taking all the vectors that combine to create a, a, a circumstance. You're removing all of those. And the energies that we have tested it so far, the symmetry would have to be broken, which gives rise to the standard model. So again, this is this uh, you know uh, I've been over. Ex I mean, the whole concept of accelerating. They talk about it as if it's a passive uh, mechanism that they somehow just accelerate particles. No, they push particles. Frankly, that's all they can do. They have to push them. All right, and to get them up to this to a, to these high speeds, that means the atoms. That means you have to take all of the motion out of the atom. Any motion in the atom you have to take out of it and you have to push just the electrons and protons in one direction. Like I said, they can't have any functional connections to each other anymore. There can't be any bits going back and forth between them. You could sort of understand that if two electrons have something between them that's keeping them at a distance from each other, right? So there's a ping pong ball bouncing between two electrons this way. And I move these two electrons this way really fast. You can understand that this ball will hit here and fly out, but this electron is disappearing and it'll never hit it. The force will end up going there. So you'll lose all of the continuity of the structure of these two electrons. They won't be able to see each other anymore. They won't know each other's exists. They won't know how close they are to each other. They'll have no information because all the information is only in one direction now. So all information going in any other direction is wiped out by the fact that you're moving the matter out of the information. So it, it, you know, you can't keep the same physics. You can't do this and then say that everything's still the same because nothing's going to be the same. The electrons won't be in the same position. They won't be in the same bound to each other. They won't, any of it, it won't be working anymore. So break all of the magnetic and electrical properties. This unification of the forces in the standard model is called a grand unification, or a grand unified theory, GUT for short. What physicists mean by a theory of everything is then a theory from which all the four fundamental interactions derive. This means it is both a grand unified theory and a theory of quantum gravity. So again, all it means is that you're taking this and looking for the elemental. You're looking for what's elemental in all of this. What is the What's the uh, checkerboard and what are the checkers? That's the definition. That's the real definition. That's what Einstein was looking for, was the checkerboard and the checkers. This sounds like a nice idea, yes. But there is no reason that nature should actually be described by a theory of everything. While we do need... So, okay, 
this part is just so wrong, right? It's just like you understanding evolution, that it starts with a simple DNA molecule and then it gains all of this complexity through time. So there's a simple mechanism, you know, the abiogenesis. Obviously, it's not simple. But we know we can go one step back, one step back, one step back, one step back. We can always get to the first chemical reaction that was that made the DNA molecule that was part of its inevitable um, lineage. You know, you could go back and find the one chemical reaction that started the whole process of creating a molecule that could replicate and that it could create a you know, it had to have a membrane and do all this thing, you know, all the little happy accidents that had to happen on that trail. And you can take the trail back, just like we can take ourselves back to being fish. Um, and, you know, that's the logical progression. And you're saying there's every reason to believe that, like the fish, it gets simpler and simpler and simpler and simpler when you get down deeper and deeper into the chemistry. You go to a flat worm, you go to a this, you go to a that, you go to an amoeba, you go to the, you know, you get to the simpler and simpler and simpler manifestation of this DNA replication. And you can find this, you know, you can at least imagine the chemistry and then the chemistry itself being a whole nother evolution. Need a theory of quantum gravity to avoid logical inconsistency in the laws of nature. The forces in the standard model do not have to be unified, and they do not have to be unified with gravity. It would be pretty, yes, but it's unnecessary. The standard. Well, I think it's necessary again if you have any respect for this idea that everything about our universe looks like it's doing this exact thing that it's evolving, that it's actually changing as it progresses through time, and um, uh, those changes are the collection of pattern and you didn't start with pattern pattern is what it's emerged out of it now the pattern could be that it just cycles you know it gets the matter condenses um, takes force out of the environment so there's less gravity and then when there's less gravity it expands because it can't stay together so it's just it's just doing this perpetually through time model works just fine without unification so this whole idea of a theory of mm. everything is based on an unscientific premise all right so she says it works fine but it only works fine for theoreticians because i don't see how it works fine for anybody who's rational anybody who's rational is saying <clears throat> what do you mean there's 400 particles inside an atom what are they doing what are the muons doing what's the tau fred doing what is the farticon doing what are, are all these stupid particles doing in this atom and then there's a whole nother group of them called antiparticles for every single one and then there's it's an entangled brother somewhere so it has an entangled brother plus it has an antiparticle who also has an entangled brother where is all this stuff how how can she say we already have a great model when the model doesn't make any sense at all it doesn't where the hell is all this crap hiding where are these anti-particles hiding? Some people would like the laws of nature to be pretty in a very specific way. They want it to be simple, they want it to be symmetric, they want it to be natural. And here So they think this crap is pretty. So, you know. Sorry. <laughs> I have to warn you that natural is a technical term. So they have an idea of what they want to be true. Then they stumble over some piece of mathematics that strikes them as particularly pretty, and they become convinced that certainly it must play a role for the laws of nature. In brief, they invent a theory for what they think the universe should well, ideas like the conservation of energy make sense because you can kind of follow it around. We see it in experiments. You just can't destroy the energy. You just can't make it go away. You can see that all you can do is transfer it to systems. It can be trapped inside of a vessel into a, a jar. I can create, I can have energy trapped in a, in a glass of hot water. I know it's in there. And I know it, if, it, if it leaves the water, if the water gets cold, the hot went somewhere. There's no other way to do it. I can't make the water go cold without making the hot go somewhere. So I know it's conservational. I know these photons live forever. The, the quanta okay never dies it just keeps hitting things and the more proximity the more things you make it hit the more energy the system has the less things it hits the less energy the system has and that's all there is so there's just stuff moving and you can condense interactions create more interactions 
and you create more interactions, that's more pressure. That's more go. That's more pushing. More interactions means more pushing because every interaction is just a punch in the face in the end. Should be like. This is simply not a good strategy to develop scientific theories. And no, it most certainly is not stand-up methodology. Indeed, the opposite is the case. Relying on beauty. So again, she, she calls it beauty when really you're saying relying on simplicity. So, you know, it's just all verbiage here, right? So she, instead of using the word of beauty, she used the word simplicity. Then her argument would sound stupid, right? Because she's saying, well, do you have no reason to think it, it's simpler going down? You have... You have no logical reason to find it preferable to have a theory that's simpler rather than more complicated, uh, that has you know fewer moving parts than more moving parts, wackier UFO kind of parts. Yeah, you'd think it would be simple. You will go into a courtroom, you want the evidence to be decisive. You want the fingerprints and the genetics and the this and the that. You don't want the wooey invisible man theory. In theory development has historically worked badly. In physics, breakthroughs in theory development have come instead from the resolution of mathematical inconsistencies. I have literally written... All right, so this is the irony part she's saying, right? Because from my perspective, that's exactly how you failed, right? So you failed catastrophically in the sense that since Newton, you've not done nothing but advance um, UFO theories, wacky ESP, silly answers to simple questions. That's all your whole thing is built on. It's a bunch of silly answers to simple questions, and it's all because of your mathematics. It's all because of your obsession, okay, with your stupid symbols. A book about how problematic it is that researchers in the foundations of physics insist on using methods of theory development that we have no reason to think should work, and that as a matter of right. I, I mean, we could just go back to the the problem of of reducing gravity to a mathematical equation, in in the Einstein case. Okay, once you say it's this idea of bending, and then you have no limit on how deep you bend. You, you, you have no, you're not accounting for the fact that the physical universe might only have so much push in it. And it can't make an infinite amount of push. There's no such thing as an infinite amount of push. There's not an infinite number of particles. There's not an infinite number of force bits. There's not an infinite number of stuff. You can't make an infinite gravity well. So simple things like that, simple logical statements where you'd say, why did you assume that the energy can be infinite? Where can you get infinite energy from? Because they didn't account for why the energy is in the universe in the first place, and that it has to be energy that's causing gravity. They came up with a theory of gravity that said, look, the bent space thing isn't energy. Gravity moves things, and they're saying it's not energy that's making things move. So that's you have to understand. So that's why they can have an infinite amount of it, because they're not accounting for it as real energy that has to be consumed to make things move. Oh, shit. I mean, this is what I mean. The hypocrisy here is just crazy. She understands how the math is, is used to... Um, the generalizations in the math are too sloppy. They're too grotesque. The math is so crude compared to the reality in terms of, of understanding all the variables. And, and that this is a tragic mistake is not to understand that you might be missing something. So in your gravity equation, you might be missing the fact that there's only a certain amount of force in the universe and that you can't have an infinite amount of force and in any one location. If any one location has an infinite amount of force, then the whole universe has to be in that location. In fact, do not work. The search for a theory of everything and for grand unification began in the 1980s to the extent that the theories which physicists have come up with were falsifiable. So this was, I mean, I don't even know why she would say that. Oh yeah, in 1980 we decided to look. That's, that's 20 years after Einstein died. What do you mean? Einstein spent his whole life looking for this. So why pretend that it started in 1980? What the hell is that? They have been falsified. Nature clearly doesn't give a damn. What physicists think is pretty math. Having said that... So again, she says again what she knows what nature is. <clears throat> she thinks nature is 400 different particles, 400 fields, uh, you know, all of this this spin properties and wacky properties that aren't really spin and blah, blah, blah. And we have, uh, you know, virtual communicating tons that bounce back and forth between space and tell things you have to go this way or you have to go that way. We have uh, whatever reverse momentatons. 
you know, reverse momentatons. You know, I throw my bowling ball and the pin hits me in the head. You know, bullshit. What do you think? I think about Lisi's and Weinstein's and Wolfram's attempts at the theory of everything. Well, scientific history teaches us that their method of guessing some pretty piece of math and hoping it's useful for something is extremely unpromising. No, it's the same exact thing as Einstein did or anybody else. They propose some kind of wacky crap and we just see who bites. And the only reason why the world bought is because Eddington sold a piece of crap experiment as the truth. Even though his own journal says, I wouldn't stake my life on these results, he sold it as if he would stake his life on those results okay so maybe the pressure of the media and everything else he just had to do it he had to make it work um, because he was afraid to not make it work he was afraid um, that all thought on the subject would be destroyed if he didn't verify it so who knows what his little quandary was of, of, of being so deceptive about the, the lack of quality of his own experiment but regardless it doesn't matter we know that's the nuance so if one of these gold from blah 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 people come up with one stupid thing, one little catch, where they discover some truth that's actually a truth, then all of a sudden everybody's going to be running over there, over there, over there, because one little thing is, is fixed. And it's, it's silly. Uh, Einstein was an aberration of circumstances, and that's all. This whole theory would have been crap if, if it wasn't for just luck. Because it doesn't say anything, frankly. It's outside of physics. His theory is outside of physics. He's giving you an explanation for movement that doesn't involve force. And that's a huge, gigantic departure from reason. And ironically, the same guy is the one saying, give me a checkerboard. So, I mean, there's a huge irony here in all of these stories that Einstein is guilty of spooky action theories. Yet he's calling other people's theories spooky action. It is not impossible it works, but it is almost certainly a waste of time. And I have looked closely enough at Lisi's and Weinstein's and Wolfram's and many other people's theories of everything to be able to tell you that they have... Yeah, unfortunately, like I said, the, the dissident road is a tough road. But the truth is, the truth always comes out of those roads, okay? I mean you know, evolution to Darwin, all of this stuff, it, it had to come out of somebody saying the crap you're saying ain't the truth. Um, the truth is this truth and it's, you know, and this is where it has to come from. So, I mean, this isn't a, even a reasonable statement. I mean, uh, you know, yeah, it's, the fact is, is that there's a bunch of bad stories and then there's a good story in the bad stories. Um, but knowing, I, I mean, you could just go through history and the ones that were right predictions and the ones that were wrong, okay? I mean, Benjamin Franklin was right about a ton of stuff, but yeah, he was wrong about plus and minus. So, I mean, that's the catch of it all. I have not convincingly solved any actual problem in the existing fundamental theories. And I'm not interested enough to look any closer because I don't also want to waste my time. Yeah, we all have limited time to devote to things, but I'm just saying that which, the, the thing that should be compelling is simplicity. None of those people have anything that makes it the universe simpler. It's just more wooey, stringy, vibrating jellyfish. It's more stuff to fit their already current assumptions about light bending gravity, you know, gravity bending light, and all these other th assumptions that if you keep those assumptions it's going to be very hard for you to come up with the checkerboard. So as long as you think checkers are moving because of gravity, you know, the, the photons, the energy, you know, and that's the only one moving and it's moving twice as much, as long as you're believing that, you're going to have a hard time connecting these dots because that dot, I would say, isn't the truth first. And it's catastrophic to any kind of logic. You're never going to be able to make anything logical out of the damn thing if you assume something that's completely wrong. I mean, not all wrong things will be catastrophic, but I'm just saying the idea of force being bent by force, that's a catastrophic change because every indication is, is that forces don't affect forces. I don't like commenting on individual people's theories of everything. I don't like it because it strikes me as deeply unfair. These are mostly researchers working alone or in small groups. 
They are very dedicated to the pursuit and they work incredibly hard on it. They are mostly Yeah, I know, but the whole point is the only way you the only way you they improve their theories is you have to challenge them. So you can be not rude, right? I mean the fact is that a lot of people just have to be rude about their critiques. And that's unnecessary. So you can just say that I don't get it. You know, uh this doesn't fit for me. If you don't fix this part that doesn't fit, I can't go anywhere with this. I mean, I'm telling you, I, I can't go anywhere with your theory, okay? Entangled particles? What are you talking about? Especially based on the thin, tiny evidence. The spin property? Everything has a spin property? How, when, when, did, was, when, when, when did you prove any of that? When did you prove a photon has a spin? When did you prove a photon has an anti-photon partner somewhere? I mean, you know, it's just silly. You're just telling stories. Be not paid by tax money, so it's really their private thing. And who am I to judge them? Also, many of you evidently find it entertaining to have geniuses with their theories of everything around. That's all fine with me. Well, it'd be interesting for you to critique these theories because somebody needs to. Just like, look, the ferro cell has been out there now for whatever, seven years or something, this silly device, okay? And there's lots of people talking about it and they think the light's actually bent. That the, you know, light curves, light's traveling curved paths because of the magnetism. Oh, they think a bunch of crap. It'd be nice if somebody showed up to say to some of these dissidents, no, you've misinterpreted it entirely. Look, we, we've looked at it under a microscope. We can see what's happening. All right, there's, there's no magic here. There's no light traveling curved paths. It's all straight line vectors of refraction. So, you know, that's important and nobody's doing it in physics. Nobody's critiquing any of this stuff. Nobody's pointing out all these things that LIGO is doing and saying, well, look, these 17 processes they're going through, right? This idea that they've invented a mirror that doesn't have any variation in how far the light goes into it. <laughs> what? Then they have another device that transforms the photons entirely. I mean, it changes their wavelength for friggin' sake. They change the wavelength of the light beam, you know, in this process. How can they know how long how far the light has traveled when they've changed the light's frequency. I mean, these are, you know, these are questions that somebody should be telling us why this can possibly be right. And again, somebody should explain to me how matter is converted into a non-force, into bent space, whatever the hell that is. How do you convert matter, electrons, protons, and the force that's trapped between them, how do you convert that into whatever bent space is. I get a problem if theories that, despite having turned out to be useless, grow to large tax-paid research programs that employ thousands of people, as it has happened. And as you probably have been somebody who fed on some of this, so again, you know, your hypocrisy is huge. Oh, your silly wasted government money is okay, but their wasted government money isn't. Oh, okay with string theory and supersymmetry and grand unification. That creates a problem because it eats up resources and can entirely stall progress, which is what has happened in the foundations of... Right, and I would argue that, yes, all of that is true. You've totally stalled progress because you don't really care about anything foundational or elemental or really getting down to understanding the difference between matter and force and understand how the differences are clear and obvious, that force is completely one thing, uh, you know, uh, one thing in terms of really simple functions, and matter is clearly simple functions, positive, negative, and that's about the only, f that's the only f feature that it has. Matter doesn't have spin, and doesn't have this, and doesn't have all this other horse shit. And that atoms can be bipolar, dipolar. <laughs> Physics. People like Lacey and Weinstein and Wolfram at least remind us that the big programs are not the only thing you can do with math. So, so again, it's all about the math, 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 math. So she writes a book, Lost in Math, and all she does is talk about fucking mathematical equations and how math is physics, and it's really not. Physics can be, it's, math is one way of drawing physics. You can draw a formula and say these are the variables, but you can also draw the variables. It's understanding what it can do. And I'm saying everything is straight lines and push. That's all there is here, straight lines and push. If two things move towards each other, it's because they're getting pushed into each other by straight lines of push. 
art as it sounds. While I don't think their specific research avenue is any more promising than string theory, I'm glad they do it anyway. Indeed. So this is hypocrisy. It's a waste of money, a waste of time, a waste of waste, a waste, 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 waste. But it's good waste. You know, it's very good waste. Keep wasting. Yeah, I mean, I'm just saying. See, this is physics. Aren't physicists aren't very logical? That's you contradicting yourself. I'm glad they're wasting resources. Physics can need more people like them who have the courage to go their own way, no matter how difficult. The brief summary is that if you hear something about I hate him, but I love you. I mean, it's just about a newly proposed theory of everything, do not ask whether the math is right, because many of the people who work on this are really smart and they know their math, and it's probably right. The question you and all science journalists who report on such things should ask is what reason do we have to think that this particular piece of math has anything to do with reality? Well, that's the real point, is to point out how all the math is now so abstract that it doesn't have variables in it anymore, it just has formulas in it. Okay, it's a formalization of formulas. It's not a formalization of variables. You know, you've, you've taken the, the critical variables, identified them, and identified their relationship. That's a good formula. It identifies relationships between mass, velocity, blah, blah, blah. That's rational math. This rash, this math is irrational. It's formula A divided by formula B. It doesn't make any sense. Because it's pretty is not a scientific answer. And I've never seen a theory of everything that gave a satisfactory scientific answer to this question. Yeah, well, you won't see it till it shows up. That's the whole thing, right? I've never seen a rabbit. Well, do you see one? <laughs> yeah, until you go where the rabbits are. Uh, so this, again, doesn't say anything else. Guess what? The tinfoil hat is the fact is the person that's going to give you the right answer is going to be wearing one of them. It's just the way it has to come. That's the way it's going to be. One of them was going to be right. Somebody has to be the first person to say, hey, if we make the wheel round, I just invented that word, well, we just cut off all that square stuff, it rolls better. Uh -huh. They observe something, okay? They observe something. And they're the first one to observe it. So I'm sure that somebody else, I can't say for sure though, right? See, I'm saying a magnet's a filter. It's a simple explanation for why there's the magnet doesn't catch on fire, why the magnet doesn't run out of magnetism. You know, it, it totally explains why the phenomenon exists. That, you know, the, the electricity going through the wire isn't creating the magnetism. It's making the substance magnetic in the sense it's making it into a filter. And all you're really doing is taking the energy that already exists in the universe, right? And coming from all directions. So I'll just draw all directions this way. And we'll just, well, I'll do the extra drawing. Okay. So this is the energy in the universe. And so it's taking this um, yellow and green isn't a great choice. But just imagine it's blue and red. Okay. <laughs> and you have an object. <coughs> And, you know, the object is the magnet. The magnet, well, I should have drawn this. Let's be precise. We'll draw the magnet as a square, and then you'll get it. Um, and so the magnet is this, okay, in the sense that it's been all the little atoms inside of it are all doing this. And what that ends up doing is pumping. And so it pumps all the yellow to come out the yellow end. The yellow that comes in and hits it reflects back. So it's all yellow coming out of this end, and the same thing is happening here. If a green thing hits up here, a blue, it comes out this end, okay? And the blues all reflect, so it's all blue. So blue, blue, blue coming out of this end, yellow, yellow, yellow coming out of this end, <clears throat> and we're all done, you know, and the magnet didn't do a damn thing. The magnet didn't use up any energy except to make this turn, and we know the turn is for free because we know we can make the turn. We know we can make the, the wire inside a magnetic field jump out of the magnetic field. We know this turning left thing is a real thing, that you take a force going this way and you turn it into some other dimension. So you have a force going in this dimension and you essentially say, I'm gonna make it come out in this dimension or in this dimension. And so it's still the same force. You didn't kill anything. You didn't lose the force. You just changed the direction that it comes out of the, into the universe in. So switching dimensions in the three dimensions 
is for free. It doesn't take, it doesn't use up anything called energy. Um, it just converts something that was going this way, right? And it just switches their role. It says send the green stuff this way, send the yellow stuff this way. And so that simple interaction creates a change in direction because the two colors switch to which direction they're going. And that's all you need. And that's, that explains why a magnet's a magnet. No energy required. It's just filtering the energy that hits it because the atoms are all arranged in a certain way between their electrons and protons to create the right turns. <clears throat> the, the turning thing is the, you know, the right order of electron, proton, electron, proton will create some, a system that turns one energy and sends the other energy straight. Simple answer, complete, solves the problem, blah, blah, blah. Thanks for watching. See you next week. As well, whatever. Can't say too many good things about your theory of theory. Okay, your theory of theories is pretty crappy. Uh, I was unimpressed. <laughs> okay, that's sort of polite, right? Uh, close, but no cigar. But it really wasn't even that close. I mean, again, your hypocrisy. Just, you know, you got to take off, you got to get rid of that hypocrisy fog that's just all around you. <laughs> you know, you reek of it. Yeah, you got to get rid of that uh, hypocrisy BO. So anyway, until the next time and such and so forth and whatnot.